In this video, we're going to carry on looking at market power and the market failure that's created in the presence of market power. In this case, though, we're going to be taking a look at the opposite of what we had with our monopolist. So remember with a monopoly, this was when we had a single seller. So we had lots and lots and lots of people wanting to buy the good, but for one reason or another, potentially due to large barriers preventing other entry, we only had one seller of the good or service. In this case here, we have the opposite case. In this case here, we have lots of sellers, lots of people wanting to sell their good, but we have one big buyer. We have one firm or one individual who dominates the market and they're the only one who buys this good or service. So this here, this is often used in labor markets to kind of represent, hey, if you're a nurse, if you're a doctor and you live here on the island, pretty much your only employer is PHSA, right? The Provincial Health and Safety, uh, I think it's the Provincial Health Safety Authority. Um, that kind of idea, right? You only have one buyer of your labor. In many cases like this, also in these kind of small towns, Walmart in some of these small towns is the primary purchaser of labor. By being that primary purchaser of labor, they have near monopsony control over the market for wages. And we'll take a look at that kind of scenario. Of course, this does go beyond our labor markets. It does go beyond one purchaser buying all the labor, but labor markets is typically where this is adapted or where this is brought to. Examples that are outside of the labor market though, in cases often with agriculture, you have lots and lots and lots of growers, lots of producers of agricultural goods. So let's go back to when we've looked at quite a bit of time. Uh, apples, producing apples, right? You have lots of orchardists producing apples. But then what you have is you have one tree fruits co-op that buys all the apples from all the orchardists. This one tree fruits co-op buys all the apples, holds on to all the apples, and then they resell that out to the superstores and the like. So one, one purchaser of all the apples, even though you have hundreds, if not thousands of orchardists producing the apples, right? And this is why really end of the day, even though we have all of these individual farmers, all of these individual orchardists, when you go to the grocery store to buy your apples or whatever, they all have that exact same sticker on them. They all have that exact same sticker on them because they were bought by that same company and then resold out. So again, that would be a monopsony kind of scenario. So let's jump over. Let's take a look at this monopsony power, briefly go through it, and again, briefly see what happens with it and why it causes, why it causes us a market failure. So let's take a look. And right, we, we could talk about it just to kind of keep things kind of keep things simple. We could talk about apples just as we finished off it. So in our market for apples, we have our axes, of course. And in our axes and all of our cases, we have our price on the vertical, we have our quantity on the horizontal. Of course, we then have our downward sloping demand curve, which is as such. And then, of course, we have our upward sloping supply curve. And now, typically, in this market for apples, we would have a whole bunch of consumers, we'd have a whole bunch of producers, and them all getting together, acting in their own best interest, they would continue to buy apples, they would continue to produce and sell apples until we wind up at equilibrium yielding for us a equilibrium quantity exchanged and an equilibrium price. So we can call that Q0 and P0 for our initial equilibrium. But in this case here, in this case, yeah, okay, we still have this downward sloping demand. This still exists, even though we have, let's just make this very clear, one purchaser. So, right, this is like where we have this tree fruits co-op that goes and buys all the apples from the orchardists. These are, this is the only buyer of apples. Well, they're still going to have this downward sloping demand for apples because, well, as they buy more and more and more apples, well, their extra benefit from an extra apple is shrinking, right? That is, the more apples they buy, the more cost they have with that, or the less they can get, the more apples they buy. So they're getting less and less incentive to buy more apples. So they're demanding a lower price as quantity increases. Keep in mind, what we also have here is that this supply, this can also be thought as our minimum willingness to accept. 
And very similarly, demand is our maximum willingness to pay. As there's only this one purchaser for apples, they really get to dictate the price that they're going to buy the apples for, right? And in this case here, the orchardists, the sellers of apples, they don't really get a say in this because they don't have any other options. If they want to sell their apples, they have to sell them to this one purchaser of apples. In this sense here, this purchaser is able to dictate the price based off of the firm's willingness to accept. And so what ends up happening as we go through this is that the firm says, okay, if I were to buy, if I were to buy, say, five apples, well, I'd be willing to pay this price for it. If I were to buy 10 apples, well, then I'd be willing to pay this higher price for those 10 apples, on and on and on, all the way up, right? And in that case there, they influence the price of apples by influencing the quantity of apples they buy. The more apples they buy, well, the higher that price per apple that they're willing to pay, on and on and on and on. We see that, right, standard in equilibrium. Well, we'd get to this P naught Q naught, but let's see what happens in this case here. Specifically, let's see how this works based off of, well, let's just take a look at an idea of a supply schedule. So in the supply schedule, well, let's, let's draw a line here, let's make a heading. We can say that we have our price of apples and we have our quantity of apples. And let's suppose the price is just going up simply one, two, three, and four. And we'll suppose our quantity of apples is going up something like five, 10, 15, and 20. So in this case here, because our purchaser gets to dictate the price, they get to say, hey, if I'm buying apples, this is the price I'm paying. And guess what? That price is that minimum price you'd be willing to accept. Well, we can work out at each point what would be the total cost to this purchaser to buy the apples. So that is, we could work out total cost of apples. And right, that would be, hey, at a quantity of five, price of one, we could work out total cost as price times quantity. Right, that's how much I'm spending. I'm buying five apples at a price of $1 an apple. So in that case there, we would get five. We would get 20. We would get 45. And finally, we would get, sorry. Yeah, 45. And we would get 80. So we'd have our total cost going through here. What we then notice is that as we work through this, we could also work out our marginal cost of this purchaser. That is, how much extra cost do they face in order to buy an extra apple? What is the extra cost for an extra apple purchased? And keep in mind, this extra cost, this is just going to be the change in my total cost for a change in output. So, okay, what do I get here? That guy there, that is plus 15 for a plus five. So 15 over five, that gives me three. Next one here, 20 up to 45. Well, in this case, that's plus 25 for a plus five. So 25 over five, that will give me five. And then final one here, we get plus five. And what do we have for our increase there? Uh, 80 minus 45 gives me a plus 35. So 35 over 5 is 7. So what we see in this case here, if we were to work through this, the comparison, this is very similar to what we did with the monopolist, right? For the monopolist, we said, hey, what was my total revenue? And then we worked out the difference between average revenue, marginal revenue. Really, we're doing the same thing here. We're taking out, taking a look at, hey, here's my cost of how many apples I buy versus what my marginal cost is. And what we'll see, I mean, what we do see here is that our marginal cost at each quantity is higher than the price. The marginal cost at a quantity of 15 is higher than the price. The marginal cost is, again, higher than the price. 
What this works out to is that, again, what we're going to have is we're going to have a marginal cost curve that's steeper than our supply curve. However, we're with our marginal revenue with our monopolist. It was always the case, hey, marginal revenue twice as steep as our demand curve. That's not necessarily going to be the case with our monopsonist. With a monopsony, it is the case that the marginal cost is going to be steeper than the supply, but we can't always make that same rule that it's twice as steep. So in this case here, what we would say is that we would have a marginal cost that is steeper, and we can draw it something like this in that case there. So now how exactly does this work out? Where do we end up determining where we're buying, right? Well, keep in mind, demand, maximum willingness to pay, also marginal benefit. A individually rationalized individual, right, or firm, is going to equalize their extra benefit from an extra unit with their extra cost for an extra unit, meaning that this monopsonist is going to look at this and they're going to say, okay, right here, that's, let's use a straight line, right here, that's where my marginal cost equals my marginal benefit. So they're going to produce... They're going to produce right there, not produce rather, but purchase right there at Q monopsonist. And then comes what price they're going to, they're going to pay for this good, right? And it seems to be a lot, to, a lot of times what we see is we see people say, okay, well, marginal cost, marginal benefit, boom, we get our corresponding price. But no, 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 no. Remember, in this case, it's the purchaser who has all the power. The purchaser gets to dictate the price. And so in this case here, the purchaser, the buyer, the consumer gets to dictate the price. What they're going to do is they're going to drive this price down as low as they can. They're going to get this good as cheap as they can possibly get it. And that means that they're going to get this good as low as they can at that minimum willingness to accept. So in that case there, they would be getting... PM, right? Price monopolist. So by having a monopolist, by having one purchaser of this good or service, they hold back the quantity which they end up buying and they get the price to be pushed down. If we were to take a look at kind of our surplus analysis, who wins, who loses because of this, we could do geometric areas here. We could do A, B, C, D, E, F, G and H. Uh, let's just keep in mind here that, yeah, I drew that, but that's not really going to be part of our geometric areas. Okay, so geometric area, let's look at consumer surplus before, producer surplus before, and social surplus before. Well, okay, before we were at P0 and Q0, so the consumer got below their willingness to pay, above the price they did pay, they got ABC. The producer got above their minimum willingness to accept, below the price they did accept of P0, so they had D, E, F, and G and H. Finally, social surplus. Social surplus was just this entire thing, so we just had A through H as our social surplus. If, however, we had a monopsonist, things change. We'd have consumer, producer, and social. And in this case here, our consumer surplus, right? Our consumer surplus is the sole purchaser of apples in this case. Well, so below our willingness to pay, up to the quantity I pay, above the price I pay. So A, B, D, E. Producers, well, above their willingness to accept, to the quantity they buy, below the price they accept, so G and H. And then finally, social surplus. Well, we're going to lose C and F as dead weight loss. So this would be A plus B plus D plus E plus G plus H. That is, in this scenario here, we have a dead weight loss to society of C and F. Right? That guy there, that is our dead weight loss due to our monopsonist. How exactly does this work if we were to think about it in a labor situation, right? Here we thought about about one purchaser of apples. What if it was one purchaser of your labor? 
right? What if it was a situation where you go to get a job and really there's only one possible employer to hire you? Well, it ultimately works out the same way. They have their demand for labor. They have how many people they would want to hire. And in this case here, well, the price, price, really, you can just think of that as your wage, how much they're going to pay you. In equilibrium, well, you would have an equilibrium wage. We'll call that wage not. And we would be happy your supply of labor, that demand for labor. And at equilibrium, we would be wage not and quantity not. Maybe quantity is how many people they hire or how many hours they end up employing people for. How many man hours, right? FTE, full-time employment hours. Okay, full-time equivalent. Alternatively, let's say it's that case where your employer is a monopsonist. They're the only one who is there to purchase your labor. Well, in this case here, they again would have this marginal cost steeper than the supply. They would set their quantity then based off of where their extra cost for an extra worker equals their extra benefit for that extra worker. And then because, hey, if you want a job, your option is either work for this company or be unemployed, they get to dictate their wage as being down here, being based off of that minimum price that you are willing to accept. Keep in mind, right, in this case here, you are providing extra benefit to the firm up here. Right, in this case here, this would be your extra marginal product of labor. This is how much extra stuff, the marginal revenue product of labor rather, how much extra money you're giving this firm from the stuff that you're producing. So right, you're giving this firm a whole bunch of extra benefit, but they're gonna pay you, they're gonna pay you down there, ah, not off the marginal cost, but off of your supply curve, off of your minimum willingness to accept. And in that case there, you would have wage one. So, hey, we saw in this case here that, hey, by having a single or having a market power in the case of our purchasers, that our purchaser, or in this case here, the purchaser of labor is able to hold down wages below this equilibrium point. This is actually one of our scenarios where we can say, hey, hey, maybe this isn't right. And by putting in situations like minimum wage laws, we can actually increase social welfare. We can actually make things better off if it was the case that predominantly large purchasers who have market power are dominating the market for minimum wage earners. That is, let's suppose Walmart, McDonald's were the two big guys who were really purchasing all of the labor at minimum wage. In this case there, it wouldn't be a monopsonist, it would be an oligopsonist right? Oligopoly versus monopoly for the buying or from the selling side. Monopsonist, oligopsonist for the purchasing side. So same kind of idea. Don't get too caught up with that terminology though. In this case, if they were artificially holding this wage low in order to get a optimal level of workers hired and maximizing their profit on whole, we could actually increase altogether social welfare by mandating, by dictating, by passing a law legislating a higher minimum wage, right? And that is any minimum wage above this wage one, that is the monopsonist wage. If we push this wage up at all, we would end up in a situation with higher social welfare altogether. So, Minimum wage laws, right? Earlier we took a look at them and we just said, boo, they're bad, they create inefficiencies. Well, okay, they create inefficiencies if we have a perfectly functioning market. If we have a case with market failure, minimum wage laws are useful. Minimum wage laws help to push up wages and increase social efficiency. Same thing can be said for unions, right? Unions are a monopsonist purchaser of uh, labor and then a monopoly seller of labor to the employer. Now, okay, a union in a functioning market, if the market was functioning just fine on its own, that union would be problematic. That union would be pushing wages up too high, would be creating an inefficient situation. If, if you had a sole purchaser of labor, right, let's say we're talking about here in BC, Let's say we were talking about our school districts, right? So this is your public school teachers. 
Well, if you want to be a public school teacher, high school teacher, junior high uh, school teacher, or uh, elementary school teacher, the only one who's going to purchase your labor is the school district. They're a monopsonist. So in this case here, they would have an incentive to hold low the number of teachers they hire and keep the wage low at a monopsonist level. A monopoly provides an offset power to that, provides market power now to the teachers to be able to actually negotiate a wage and be able to push this wage up beyond this minimum point. So in a case where you have a, monops a monopsonist purchaser, it's often useful to either have legislation in place to challenge that wage, such as minimum wage laws. Of course, there's lots of problems with, hey, our monopsonist, or one purchaser, they would have a vested interest to get involved in politics, to capture that, to keep minimum wage laws low. The other solution would be to allow unions to exist, of course. Stronger unions, bigger, stronger unions battle against this monopsonist power, and those bigger, stronger unions would be able to push up wages and actually increase social surplus, social efficiency altogether. So again, in this case where we have a market failure, unions have a role to play and would actually be very helpful in solving our problem. Okay, that's our overview for monopsony. We're not getting into a ton of detail into this like we did monopoly. This is more just to show you that, hey, this exists. We have the opposite side of this. It's not just monopolies selling things. It's also monopsonists buying things. And we can have market power exist on both sides of that from the seller and the purchaser. If you have any questions about this, feel free to reach out to me either through D2L or by email. Thanks.